Uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks once again for being here. Uh, anyone joining for the for the first time, I think the the whole purpose of this hour is just to leave you uh, feeling like it's actually possible to be a, a effective salespeople in the current climate, uh, and I think more importantly, to leave you with some actionable takeaways that just make you, at worst, marginally better at, at prospecting. And I, I suppose that's uh, just a call to action for the panel today, just to to make sure that we um, try and wrap up some of our points with something where someone can actually. Uh, take away and, uh, and 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 put it into into practice. We we do have an agenda, uh, and we've definitely got some of our own ideas to guide the conversation. Uh, but we absolutely want to answer your questions in real time. So can you make sure that you use the chat feature and and send your questions to all panelists and attendees, not just the panelists? Freddie's put a comment in the in the chat already about that. I think. It increases the chances that we, we might get a bit of excitement going. Um, we absolutely don't just want to sit here and massage everyone's ego. Uh, and a difference of opinion uh, and approach is absolutely fine from the panel and also in the, in, in the comments as well. Uh, I think just to touch on uh, the agenda for this week, uh, I'm going to introduce the panel. But after that, um, we're talking on the topic of building relationships versus pipeline. And has work from home changed the approach? And is anything different around, uh, around that, that, that headspace? What authority do we have to speak on the on the topic? Uh, I think at Engage Tech we're currently delivering just over 100 fully qualified appointments a week for our clients in the tech sector. We're well aware that there's opportunity out there right now, um, and 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 today we're teaming up with uh, some people from other companies. Firstly, we've got John Dyson. Uh, he's VP in the UK for a business called Cyber Reason. Uh, previously worked for the likes of uh, HPE, Forcepoint, and, and Symantec. Uh, John, uh, what traits? Are your highest performing salespeople displaying right now? I think um, you know the majority of them have, have gone through uh, peaks and troughs uh, in, in terms of their attitude. So it, it, you know most are, are used to working remotely, but they've still had to go through that that um, acclimatization of you know you know we we still have to you know entry into an opportunity. So. It's that relentless approach. They know that they now need to increase their output. You know, so whereas before they may have been focused on 70 to 100 calls, it's it's now closer to 150 calls and having to get hold of people. Um, and it's also the human aspect. You know, so a lot of the the people that that kind of work with me are saying that what's what they've really had to work on is is making it humanized and and differentiating um, themselves from other people that are that are relentlessly trying to get hold of uh, the, the same the same people. Um, yeah, so you know things have changed, but I would say that the the approach, the end goal has uh, has has not changed. You know there are people out there that want to have good conversations, but the topics of those conversations have, have really changed. So we've had to change our approach. Yeah. So people increasing their efforts and, and output uh, and yeah. also doing their best to stand up for the crowd, um, being unique and, um, and authentic. Yeah, ab absolutely. Be, you know, the, the human element is, is particularly important. You know, there's, uh, there's a lot of people out there that are not used to homeworking and, and are really struggling with the, the mental approach to homeworking. So it's, you know, it's, you know, we have a, we have a task at hand and that's to, to gain a contact, to gain a meeting, to gain an interaction. But, you know, what we've got to be mindful of is that we're building a relationship at the same time. So, you know, that call might not lead to a meeting straight away but you can, you can look to build a relationship where a call in a week's time might turn into an opportunity. So, you know, it's, it's really important that we build those relationships over a, over a prolonged period of time too. Sure. Thanks, John. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Ben Smith. Uh, he heads up a business development team for a company called ReachDesk who specialise in direct marketing and supporting engagement across the, the sales funnel. Ben, how have you typically been starting net new conversations in, in the last month? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so I think it's about taking a really targeted approach during this time. So thinking about every conversation that you want to have and understanding where that's coming from. So before we even get into the conversation, I think it's about finding which companies are doing well right now, um, which companies you can make an impact with. 
Um, that might be looking at like the inbounds which are coming in and then putting together uh, a list of similar companies to really target that way. It might be looking at your existing customers and finding out who are the power users right now. Um, and really speaking to those customers that you have access to, to find out what, what questions they're asking themselves. Once you then get all that knowledge together and understand what's going on in, in, with these people every day, um, you can then really take a targeted approach. So it might be that you're reacting to triggers a lot more. So looking at new job uh, funding, for us it's working on sort of events that have been canceled and seeing how we can target our messaging that way. Uh, then it's about the personalization piece. So reading blog posts, which, which these people are, are putting up, reading what's going on on their Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, even Facebook, understanding their home challenges as well as their business challenges. I think if you're targeting a C, C-suite person, then you're gonna be a lot more business focused. But if you're targeting from the bottom up as well, then finding out the, the day-to-day issues these people are going through and how you can help them. Um, it might be that you go in with a message relating to their hobbies or music or, or food interests, but it's about starting that conversation. So finding that hook that, that's really gonna to relate to them um, and then solving that business issue that way as well. So I think you know, a, a great way to start the conversation is not just through email or phone calls, but opening up all these different channels that you're, you're able to connect with your prospects on um, is a good sure. way to look at it. Thanks, Ben. It sounds like kind of preparation in advance uh, is, is, is a very good guide for how you could be starting those, those conversations. Um, just to move on to our third, third panel member, um, we've got Greg Freeman. Uh, he's VP of Sales at Monoro Data. Uh, I think one of the most interesting things uh, about having Greg on today is that he's started in that job just a day or so ago. Um, there are a lot of salespeople out there, Greg, uh, who, who will be going into new roles soon. I and mean, we know there are some sectors that have been, been hit hard. Like, I think that there would be some value for them in understanding like, what your plan is to start strong in, 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 the, in the new role in the, I suppose, in a different kind of climate that maybe you're expecting. Yeah, um, I was obviously just saying when we were on the call before, it's, it's a weird one going into a business having never met the founders. Um, obviously, I'm coming in to sit, sit on that, that board with them and, and have those conversations, but the power of influence doesn't go out the window when, uh, when you've never met people in person, but um, it's obviously harder. We all know that. That's why you'll have a better conversion rate when you do in-person demos than uh, face-to-face, and that's the same actually internally as well. Like there's there's battles that you, you can't take on right now because you've never met those people to influence them. So that's the first thing that's been really interesting. Um, the first thing I've done is um, I've led on a rebrand, which isn't something anyone's, everyone's going to be able to do when they go into a new company, but the, the company brand will be changing. Um, but I think outside of your typical 30, 60 day plan, um, 90 day plan, which everyone should be made to do almost by their, by their managers and by the execs. Um, that's, that's the, the high level stuff. Um, five things that I think is really super important every time I go into a new role. Um, so the first is the foundational work. So working out what messaging has worked and hasn't worked. You can do that in the obvious way, which is if you've got SDRs, AEs who are currently successful, speak to them. Um, the next is to speak to current clients. So do ask them the tough questions. It's not, um, it's not all about, um, oh, like, what do you like about the product? What do you like about the brand? What do you like about the company? Ask them what they don't like. Uh, it, it's quite good from a, it's quite a good opportunity for start to, um, get the key almost CS data that you, that you might need. Like you might find that customers aren't as, as solid and, and sticky as you thought they were all that kind of stuff, but also it shapes how they want that journey to look. Um, you need to nail a niche. I think whether you're coming in as an SDR, an AE or a, or a VP, it doesn't really matter. You've got to work out a very quick way of learning to be good within a particular space or a particular vertical or a particular group of people, because that's going to be the quickest way that it starts to snowball. So, um, get, get focused early on, on just a, a pocket of people, a pocket of account types that you can learn the software, learn the product through those is probably the best way of doing it. And then obviously you can expand out to other, other verticals. Um, a big one for me, and I'll probably end up talking about this a little bit later with the importance of relationships is to build relationships within the wider ecosystem. I think it's something that a lot of people, especially when they're new to SDR and new to AE and they don't do as well as they could. So find people who are like them and build those relationships, not only with customers or prospects, but other people who can help you within, within the, the wider ecosystem. 
Um, and then obviously you need to plan and map your accounts and that's going to be a really big one and you're going to have to sit down and do that, work out what those accounts look like, who the champions are, who the DMs are, etc. Um, but yeah, I think, I think there's, there's a, a few things there that you can just do as soon as you start any job that are, are going to add value and, and hopefully help you pick up the software quicker, but also help you build all sorts of relationships quicker. Sure. Thanks very much for that, Greg. I'm sure there's uh, plenty of people that will take some, take some value from, from that. Um, what one that I hadn't considered before was yeah, focusing on a particular sector to, to, to really kick things off. I think that's, um, I think that's a really good one. Um, just rolling into the uh, the, the uh, agenda for today, we've got uh, a, a kind of balance that maybe needs to be found between uh, generating pipeline and, and, and purely uh, starting relationships. One thing that I've seen as a, like, a throwaway comment on a lot of uh, conversations uh, around just selling right now is a word em of empathy and it's something which I've probably been guilty of using myself. Um, but uh, I think that we needed to sell with empathy before and we still do now, but what does that actually mean? Um, and yeah, John, I think you kind of alluded a little bit to this when you when you were um, introducing yourself earlier. Like, what does selling with empathy mean to, to you? Um, I think to, to me, it's uh, we, we have to be cognizant of just the, the kind of the situation, the people that we're trying to reach or that we are reaching are, are in, first and foremost. You don't know that uh, that they could be in a challenging situation where they're away from uh, their loved ones. I mean, we I can give you a point of reference. We've uh, I've got we've got a, a prospect that his wife is having um, their first child, and uh, he's he's working from home because he can't go to the hospital, um, and they they've got a video link. Um, so that uh, you know he can he can still be there, but he's not allowed in the hospital because you, you know of obviously the situation, which I found a little bit you know a little bit crazy. But it, you know it just gives you an example of kind of a thought process or a situation that that people are, are working through as well as with their modern their their working life. So I think it's really important to tread carefully, um, but equally you know some people like that that uh, a good solid conversation that's well based so i think it was both ben and greg alluded to this that you know do your research don't just call up and you know look to to push something that you know be, because we're we're looking to hit that end goal it's more important than ever to to go with something that's conversationally uh conversational you know, so what I try and get the team to do that, that I work with is um, don't just talk about things that are happening in the industry. Try and stay away from the whole COVID kind of opinion. Um, you know, have, have something else to talk about um, that, that we're either seeing or um, that's happening to, to you individually, what, we, what you've read. Um, I've noticed that a lot of customers or prospects are doing a lot more uh, online courses and a lot more reading so you, you know um, it's it's just really having that that empathy to build that relationship and not just straight into you know the reason for the call um, just to give you an idea as well I did ask a customer how many calls they they were taking in one day and one one customer had had over a thousand calls individual calls to their mobile in a day it was it was an insane number and um you, you know so they're, they're even getting to the point now where they're looking to take their mobile and, and forward it or you, you know look at different ways that they communicate within their business so yeah we, we have to be cognizant of that does that in does that change your uh expectation on salespeople to sell the fact that they need to be more like for you, yeah. did, like, is, has that changed the dynamic, or is it just you still expect them to do that, but they just need to do it better because they need need to be more aware of no, uh, I mean, we, we, the situation. We have like, uh, I would say that we've got four or five approaches. So, so, so one is obviously we use Engage Tech to do some proactive calling um, through uh, what we would call warm data. Uh, but also we use we use your data. We have another approach, which is um, we're sending out things like care packs or, or Kindle vouchers or 
you know, we're emailing things out to the customer, um, trying to provoke the customer or the prospects to uh, inward bound uh, callers. And it's, it's been pretty successful in that most people are either actively calling us to thank us for the gift um, and, you know, will then entertain a conversation. And we've, we've probably seen, uh, we wouldn't normally do that, uh, but we've, we've probably seen around about a 30 to 40% increase in the number of people inbound that are, that are calling us. Um, working with partners. So, you know, obviously as a vendor, we, we, work, we have a strong partner network. So we're spending a lot of time working with our partners, trying to understand their customers and using their expertise and their reach uh, because they can have uh, a, a more varied conversation. And then the, the final one is um, looking at how we can add value back into the market that's not just about talking about what we do. So two of the things that we do is one, we've been putting golf lessons on for prospects and customers, um, which we, we've had five, 600 people attending across, uh, across all our uh, potential touch points and and then the other one we've we've been putting um comedy acts on um so on a friday we have half an hour 45 minutes of different uh, comedic acts and that's more about generating association to our brand so there's there's nothing about what we do as a company it's more about you know giving something back yeah. and, and then when you put all that together hopefully you start to you start to generate uh, more kind of association with the brand and and you know it's 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 less aggressive in your face sales approach yeah thanks john i, th I think that ties in like quite closely with what the thought process is at, at reach desk then i'd imagine uh, and, and there are probably some uh, parts of what john described which is very much in line with how you support companies so how have yeah. you seen businesses use your services to support that kind of empathetic approach yeah, so I think with empathy, you just really have to understand the situation of that person you're trying to have the conversation with, which it, it can be quite hard. So, you know, doing your research on LinkedIn, if you see that somebody's got some children, you can probably understand that their work day is quite a challenge right now. Um, you know, imagine trying to be in the office with children running around everywhere. It, it's, it's quite hectic. So how can, you, how can you earn your right to have that conversation when they're busy? Like they're busier than they've ever been. So sending them something like a, a, a lunch voucher saying, I know you're really busy. I just want to help you take one thing off your to-do list. Here's some lunch on me. Um, it's a really good way to earn, earn that right to a conversation. It sparks their interest. You're giving them a deposit and giving them something before even asking for something. Um, in that e-gift card, in that voucher, you can then put some blog content or a message that is really going to help them with their business needs as well. So you're tying in uh, you're, you're getting them hooked with something which is fixing their day-to-day -day, um, problems, but then you're also giving them something which can help with, with their business needs as well. And I think if you understand as much as you can what's going on in terms of business needs, so really doing your homework on what different personas are focusing on right now. So as we said, like talking to your existing customers, um, it really helps you to be specific in that content that you're pushing forward to them um, and that message you're getting across. And it might take five different messages before one of them resonates with them and, and really answers a question that they're currently asking. So find out what those questions are that they're, they're asking themselves and then make deposits to, to help them answer those questions. Um, so that's how then you can sort of build on that empathy approach, I think. Sure. Greg, I saw you nodding at the golf lessons there. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> why, why the hell not? Eh? Like you may as well. Like we, I think that's that's the probably the um, the. It's not necessarily on the empathy point, but it the something that I have seen being done across the market with companies that I'd consider good companies um, who are doing things in the right way is finding outside like out the box type ways to do it. I think what it has done a really good job of this whole situation is make people get creative, sit down and think, what, what can we do that we would never have normally done? And John's gone as far as obviously the golf lessons and the, um, uh, and the comedy, but equally actually is also using the idea of gifting, which is a common, becoming a more commonplace SDR and an AE function, but actually it's this situation which has driven 
they like driven that company to use it, which is is fantastic, and it, it looks like it's working. and And I think it, it uh, my at my old company just before I left, um, we we decided that we were going to offer what is in essence a freemium model for this period and see how that goes. And that's obviously something that you can then move ahead. And that was with the empathy of what are what are particularly selling into recruitment previously. What are people struggling with? time money and managing people remotely so if you give them something that's useful for free and helps them manage people remotely it is showing empathy but it's kind of targeted empathy because i think that's the that's the key to anything in sales right you've got to be adding value like people confuse rapport with um like how to build rapport, I think is something that people get quite confused on. Like nobody wants a phone call. We've all got enough friends, right? If we, if we wanted people <laughs> to ring us and talk to us about football, we'd, we'd ring one of our mates. So it is, it's getting creative and thinking outside the box, but in a way that still adds professional value to that person and still adds um, value to their, their, their day job and, and making their lives easier. And stuff like comedy is fantastic. It adds to their personal life as well. But ultimately, the gift inside of things does, does and, and the, the freemium version of, of the software is a really good way of showing empathy with their current professional situation, whilst also making sure it's adding professional value and not necessarily just trying to put an arm around them because we've all got people to put arm, arms around us. So, um, yeah. and, and, we, and we also should carry on selling and, and there's obviously different creative ways of carry on selling, but, and, and those sound like some really good ones to be fair. Yeah. I think that the, the, the points for me to, to take out what you guys have said is that um, there's definitely a, a part of this where if you can help someone, that's going to probably put you higher on, in the list in terms of them taking your, your cold outbound approach. Um, uh, agree, Greg, if you can make that helping them professionally, it puts you more in a position as like a strategic advisor. Yeah. But um, I would say that salespeople out there really should not be using uh, this take an empathetic approach to sales as a ticket to not sell right now. Like there's, there is selling with empathy, uh, which is important, but like the, the fundamentals of every activity that people need to be doing is like the end goal is a sale still. Um, and it's really important that it doesn't become, well, at least from my perspective, uh, um, a ticket where everyone just suddenly becomes really blunt uh, and isn't moving anything through the funnel just cause they, uh, they, they just want to kind of preserve, preserve relationships. Um, which actually just leads me on to, um, uh, to, to the next question. I'll stick with you on, on, on this, Greg. Um, another thing I've seen is people are kind of talking about I'm building relationships for when this is over. Uh, and one of the things for me is I don't really think it's clear when this is going to be over. Uh, and even if the kind of work from home stuff lifts, we may well be in a, a pretty tricky economy after that. So what's your, what are your, what your views on that, on, on that mindset, Greg? Yeah, I think I think you're right. We don't know when this is going to be over. I mean, I, the way that this has been handled, this is going to do two things, right? So there's going to be the political and the medical shift towards everyone can go back to work. But equally, there is going to be this element of, is there a point in us all going back to an office? Is this the new normal? And, and of course there is, and there'll, there, there will be a transition back to the old normal. But we are going to have to get used to, to this and um, finding different ways to contact people because they are going to be spending um, spending more time at home. Um, but I think the the big thing with what you said about not dropping off from selling and linking to the whole empathy piece is there are certain areas of um, industry right now which are flourishing, and I think it's all about who who your audience is, knowing your audience, knowing your market, knowing what's happened in it. Um, I saw a really good list actually that someone had done the work that we all probably should have done when this happened, which was to literally break every vertical down into a scoring system and go, who's succeeding right now? Who's failing? Let's make sure we're speaking to the ones that were scoring as a one and not speaking to those who are five. So examples of that were the ones were things like medical devices, pharma, supermarkets. There must be mid-sized supermarket chains who've got massive logistical nightmares that they've never had before so if i'm selling into them i can be selling constantly um all the way through to your bottom end which is your leisure your hospitality and recruitment who are obviously suffering massively at the moment um so your approach has to be about who you're selling to and and if you it's again it's another really good opportunity to pivot and you may be pivoting based on what the new normal is going to be if your software and your product development doesn't align with the future world as we're going to see it, then you probably need to be engaging 
your product team, engaging your marketing team and saying, how are we pivoting as a whole business, not just me as a salesperson? Because I can go out and I can speak to a different vertical, but if the product doesn't align with the success in that vertical, if the marketing messaging isn't aligning with the success in that vertical, that isn't going to be successful for me as a salesperson. So make sure that you're speaking to the group around you and as you are driving these outside of the box ideas, make sure they align with what everyone else is thinking, because that's how you're going to be a success as a salesperson and therefore making the business more successful off the back of that. Yep. Sure. And I think that that's so important for, for people in sales development on this call to take note of, which is right now, uh, there are still companies out there who are profitable, who have um, probably seen some benefit from the, the, the current climate in a professional sense. Uh, and are very much worth prospecting into uh, in the here and now. Uh, and uh, if you're looking for a better way, a better way to target uh, uh, pr uh, potential customers and actually sell right now, rather than just build relationships for when this is over, focus on those industries. Mm. I also think it's a good okay. time to be talking to those people that um, are in those industries that aren't doing so well right now. If somebody has been unfortunately let go from a company, then they're going to have another job in the future. So, you know, as sad as it is, they probably do have a bit more spare time on their hands. So if you're looking to build those relationships for the future, um, I think it's still important to engage with these people and, and have those conversations with them as well. Because if you can still solve a problem that they faced in the past and they are likely to have in the future as well, uh, and you can help them out in some way um, w with starting that conversation, then I think that's a really good way to build that relationship up. Creep in. Um, I just want to jump into uh, a couple of different questions which have been um, uh, thrown by people when they were registering and also in the, in the, in the comments so far. Um, I have a quick question. If SDRs are going to use telemarketing as an approach to book appointments, aren't they being met with potential prospects voicemails since majority of people are now working from home? And how would you solve that, um, solve that situation? John, uh, how have you found uh, people on your team in terms of telemarketing, uh, speaking to, uh, or hitting voicemails, how would you typically approach that? Um, it, it's, it's a real challenge, uh, uh, that, that, that whole situation. I think that you've got to get the balancing acts right between, um, you know, you want to leave a message, but I, I guess, I can only talk about our experience. So my team don't leave a message unless they've already got a pre-existing contact or relationship with the individual. Um, the reason for that is that what we're typically finding is that, uh, and we've, we've tested this with existing customers, is that they're not listening to their voicemails. Um, they're working off WhatsApp. They're working off um, different, slack or different communication methods so they know if if it's a voicemail that's been left it's it's typically not someone from the business so they've they've moved the communication method so uh, i just think that you know our experience has been a negative one so uh, we would we would have that individual down and we would look to recall that individual within a within a, a usual process um what, what we've also tried is where we're hitting voicemails is that we've tried a different mechanism, a different medium. So we, we may send an email um, to, to that individual or we, we might use one of the other, other processes that, that I, I talked about earlier. So we might put them on. Um, one of the ones I've seen is sending a speedboat out without the remote control and, um, you know, using that as a way to get people to phone back. Um, it's an interesting one, but you know, quite, it's, it's, it's got a 50% hit rate, um, within our business. Uh, we've seen it with things like, uh, I, I don't know, anything remote controlled basically. And it's, it's cheap, it's effective. And, and actually, you know, it's a, it, it's, it's a good way of most people are at home with kids that have got kids and, you know, they, they really do appreciate, you know, some, some free stuff for the kids to play with. But, uh, but yeah, so, so we, we do try different mechanisms, but we try and stay away from leaving a voicemail. I, I think on that point, uh, it would be very unlikely, I think, that a prospect would listen to your voicemail as a, as, as a, as a cold interaction 
and then think to themselves, I'm going to now pick the phone up and call this individual back. Uh, and, um, and so if you are going to leave a voicemail, I would definitely be accompanying it with contact on another platform, whether that's an email or, or a message on LinkedIn. Greg, sat up there. I don't know if there was something you wanted to... Yeah, so <laughs> interestingly, I quite like voicemail and it's a, it's a debate that I constantly have. Um, and it isn't, to get a call, it isn't to get a call back. It never yeah. is. And, and I think the original, the original question um, for, um, that was put into the panel, um, I think it was from uh, Amigo. Amigo. Yeah. Um, that's a data thing, realistically. Like what he's obviously describing there is if you call an office phones and they're not being forward, forwarded through. If you've got a decent data provider, whether it's a Cognizum, a Lusher, a Lead IQ, whoever it might be, you, you, should, be, you should be phoning mobiles. And when, when I say I like voicemails, I tend to only like them when I'm, when I'm phoning mobiles. Um, but I don't see them as a way of getting a call back. It happens one in a thousand times and it's the best moment ever when it does happen. And that's when you've like kind of nailed your pitch. Um, <laughs> but I think what I've always found it is, is a decent additional touch point. And like John says there, you've got to build it into a wider plan. But at least when that person goes, I've, I've very often had, oh yeah, you left me a voicemail, didn't you? And, I, and I'm like, yeah, I wasn't expecting you to call me back, but I, like, I'm glad that you remember that. And I'm glad you, it gives you a bit of context about why I'm calling you again. So I actually do quite like voicemails, but very much as a touch point where I'm not expecting comeback on it rather than a, oh, if it doesn't, if I don't get a call back, I fail kind of thing. It's very much a, a brand awareness, personal recognition piece rather than a callback requirement. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, ben, have you, have, you, have you seen much of a, a shift in like the time of day that you're, um, that you're getting people on the, on the phone or, or contacting them? Because that was something that uh, someone put in the, in the form when they registered for this, which is, yeah, what, what are the best times of day to prospect? Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I, I've been struggling, to be honest, to get people on the phones. Um, even with having direct dials, I think people are just inundated with, with phone calls right now. And I think most people, I know when I look at my work process, I'm in front of my laptop all day. Like, this is where, this is where I'm kind of hanging out. So previously to all this, like the, the most success I had when targeting the C-level decision makers was always early in the morning. So sort of from eight o'clock till nine o'clock, um, that's when I would like to get all my calls done. And then around three o'clock was, was typically good as well. So, you know, I think just, just think about your, your day to day and your, your processes. Like when, when are your quiet periods where you're not, you're not writing emails or you're not doing all, all of your tasks. And, and that's probably, probably the, the way to look at it right now. Yeah, I think, um, I think for, from an engaged tech perspective, we've pretty much built an entire company uh, around uh, cold calling and, uh, and, and knowing like, the best times of day to, to get people on the phone. Um, we know that there's definitely like a little lift around 2 p.m. Uh, just like a, it's, it's, it's a pretty random like, pocket where you can, get, you can get people. But um, our entire um, working day is built around two periods. One is start, so 8, 8 15 until 10.30. Uh, and then a second period from four uh, until close of play, 5.36, you can definitely still get people. Um, and that, in both of those periods, what we focus on is a very um, clear objective, which is there are no other activities that are in play. Um, all you're doing is picking up the phone and outbound prospecting. And one thing I would, I would say um, to, just to everyone here is that it doesn't get easier uh, in this situation that we're in um, and so what that means is if you were making 100 calls previously to see success, um, maybe now it needs to be 200. Uh, and um, I think that's something which we, uh, we don't, uh, I don't think you can afford to kind of shy away from. Um, but I, I know for me personally, uh, now from working uh, from home, I'm probably at my computer working 7.30ish, where previously that might have been 8, 8.15. Um, and I think uh, there've been many nights um, where had a little bit of a break at five o'clock, but you come back to your computer and might still be there at seven. Um, and so what I would say is certainly don't be afraid to prospect outside of those immediate work working hours. Uh, I think you, you once in a while might be better by, by uh, if you're calling someone at seven, seven thirty on their mobile, I, I maybe say that's a bit late, uh, but certainly the hours have, have opened up and, and we've got a data scientist where we've seen that um, they've done some work on our CRM and across our entire company, people are a lot more active. Uh, across a wider spread of hours than they were um, than they were previously. LinkedIn's great out of hours as well. Like link, LinkedIn's always my go-to kind of post six thirty seven p.m. If you just want to have a 
a quality conversation with someone via messenger, then that, that tends to always be the best time for, yeah. for the LinkedIn side of things in my experience. Greg, um, yeah. just on that, like, how do you uh, typically position that, that kind of a conversation? Like, is, is LinkedIn better for a kind of short one or two line message? Do you put almost like email size content in there? Like, how do you, how do you start those conversations? <laughs> so um, actually my most successful channel ever is a single message which has a swear word in, basically has emojis in and is a joke to, to start a conversation. Um, like I, I hate traditional selling, if I'm honest. I hate bullet points. I hate, um, I hate long text. I hate everything about traditional selling. Um, and uh, if you, if you um, yeah, if, if I ever send you something with bullet points, it means I've got desperate. So just be aware of that. <laughs> um, the, and there's some really good resources for helping you get more creative on, on your copy. Um, and I don't know if you've heard of a group called, well, a group on Facebook called Charm Offensive. Um, if you search Charm Offensive, it's a guy who basically made all his money from writing clever emails and clever, clever social messages. Um, so that's well worth looking at. Um, yeah, so I, I tend to, it is a pitch probably, if I'm honest, but it's a very jokey, very human pitch. And if you, it, it tends to be the kind of thing where people go, oh, I never respond to LinkedIn messages, but this is funny, fair play to you. And at least if they've responded, then you can have a bit more of a conversation with them. Because all, you, all you're ever looking for is that first engagement, isn't it? That first acknowledgement of your existence in a way. Um, yeah, yeah. And you can go from there. So um, yeah, with, with people that I've been, um, with people that I've, I'm cold to, it will be something quite jovial, something quite charm offensive. Quite offensively. Um, if it's somebody that I've been engaging with, whether it's liking content, commenting content, et cetera, it'll probably reference that directly over time. And that'll be when I really try and take that conversation from I'm liking your content, I'm content, I'm commenting to right now I'm going to pitch you and it's not going to be a direct pitch, but this is what I want to talk about. Let's get, let's get down to business kind of thing. So um, yeah, yeah that, that's, that's probably the two ways I do it depending on whether it's cold or someone I've been engaging with. So you will actively make a transition from this has been like fun having a jovial chat to like, and then you'll say like now onto what I want to speak to you about. Is that? Yeah. I mean, ultimately, Again, I'm not here to make friends, am I? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's, that's, that's the reality of it. Like, I, I, I like to be liked and I like people to like me and that's a big part of sales and, and people don't buy people, they buy expertise and, and that kind of thing is all, all part of that conversation. But um, we, I am there. If, if, I feel, if I feel like I've got something that can help you and something that can benefit you professionally, something that can benefit your business, that is ultimately what I want to talk about. Whether I've been engaging and adding value to you for ages, that is what I'm getting to. So sure. why, why be shy about that? Like we are all salespeople. We are, we are, all, we are all here to sell. To sell. So whether we, however we do that, whether it's a trusted advisor or whether it's terrible traditional sales, it, it's up to you. But like, we're, we're, we're not here to make friends kind of thing. So let's, let, let's add value. Let's have good conversations. But let's talk about the things that's going to add, add value to each other professionally in the long run, which is whatever we have to, to help each other with. Sure. I, I think that's like really important for people to, to take away, which is just that like you're someone that has seen good experience from striking up something, which is jovial, fun, et cetera but then there isn't necessarily uh, any fear around then moving that on to this is why I'm speaking to you. And this is what, this is what the, the, the topic is around. And you obviously haven't had like major pushbacks on, 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 on people uh, responding. In, in two oh, every, ways. Every, every, every now and again, well. yeah, exactly. every, 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 now, every now and again, I get a middle finger, but it's fine. That's just a different yeah, yeah. emoji. Right. So, of course. Uh, but no, yeah, it, no people, people, people get it. People get it at the end of the day, I think in a lot of cases and, and they like the fact that you've taken a different approach because you could have just sent them five bullet points about how great your product is that they'll never actually look at and they'll wonder why they're actually connected with you. At least if you've made them smile, made them laugh and then you're talking, it's, it's, yeah. um, it, it's a bit of a personal value add as well. For sure. Thanks, Greg. Uh, John, do you, um, do you encourage your individual salespeople, whether they're in sales development or, or beyond that, uh, like focus on their own bespoke messaging or is there quite a clear kind of playbook that you roll out across the across the company pros and cons of, of both from your perspective yeah um so so we do we actually do both so i i i think that you've got to kind of uh have a, a you know a you not uniforms but you have to have a core message an elevator pitch you, you know what's what you're trying to get across to you know that that prospect within the first 30 seconds of the call 
I mean, ultimately, that's going to decide whether or not that person just says no and hangs up or, you know, will will entertain a conversation. Um, so we have we have, you know, a very similar elevator pitch that people will um, will make their own. Uh, and then it's really down to different individuals and using their expertise in different sectors. So, you know, the people that work with me uh, typically have a, a sector that they'll focus on. So they'll, they'll spend a day and it, it may be just utilities and they'll, they'll hone their pitch around what are the advantages of using our technology for that particular sector. So, you know, have something that's, that's, you know, specific to a particular market, which for, for our technology, there are, there are some uniform uh, advantages across all sectors, but there are some particular, um, uh, particular points that only apply to certain sectors. So, you know, we, we make sure that we, we, we don't cookie cutter everything across the board, that we, we tailor it per, Per, per individual or uh, per, per sector that we're trying to target. And I think it's important as well, particularly with trying to keep your own sanity, that, that you add, that, you know, you have fun with it, you get, uh, you know, um, we're all used to working in environments where people are doing similar sort of things around us and it, it kind of helps you with your motivation. So when you're, when you're at home on your own is, you know, so what, what, what I try and get the guys to do is, is um, or the team to do, is to take regular breaks um, and look to, you know, I, I like the core selling time. Um, we, we start at 8.30, we have a, a um, we, we then work through to around about 11 and then the guys have uh, a little bit of time off because we're, we're finding across lunch hours, it's, it's more optimum. So I like the guys to have a break around about 11 because between 12 and one, we're finding that we're getting hold of people a lot more regularly uh, or between 12 and two. So, so we're varying the hours that we're working. We're not keeping that rigid and we're just seeing what's working and what's not. And um, we're asking for opinion from people that we end up having conversations with what's work, you know, what they've seen, what's good and bad. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a tried and tested method. You, you've you've got to keep, you know, evolving. And I think you know the the panel have, have I've certainly picked up some good ideas from the panel today as well. Thanks, John. And Ben, obviously, you're probably doing this day day to day, or like feet on the ground more so. For you, do you find that you like the freedom of uh, like prospecting uh, in a personalised way for you, or, or do you have a playbook that you follow? How, how does that work at Reach Desk? Yeah, I think it's important to recognize everyone's individual strengths. I've got um, a BDR, Nabila, and she's, she's really great at creative writing. So she can whip out some like really fun poems to prospects um, all about reach desk and how we can like help with their direct mail needs and stuff. But it's just so funny and so lighthearted. And I think if you've got BDRs in your team that, that have these skills, then they should be able to use it freely, um, especially now when there's so much doom and gloom in these messages. Like, I don't want to read a message or an email that's starting with COVID-19. Like, I know it's about, like, I'm bored of it. Like, if you can prospect me with something a bit of fun, a bit of humor, then I'm way more involved. Like, that to me is cutting through the noise. Um, so I think then these, like, cadences are still really important and going through those processes. But those out of cadence um, actions where it's like a LinkedIn voice note or video message, or if you're sending a vidyard, for example, like, they're really great channels to be using and you can bring your personality into those channels because it's a lot more face-to-face -face, um, than, than what, what it is just over a cadence. Yeah. I think that backs up like something that John said earlier as well, which is that the salespeople right now for him that are showing the, um, the best results are the ones that are working the hardest and the ones that are standing out. And I know that a short poem would stand out a lot more than the four or five uh, lines standard a format email that um, probably comes into my inbox 50 plus times a day. Um, I just wanted to move on to an, another question uh, that, that, that came through. Uh, biggest objection now uh, is it's not a good time because of COVID. Um, what, what can you do about this, uh, this objection? Uh, I wouldn't mind uh, just kicking the discussion off. 
I've always been of the view that if someone gives you an objection within the first 10 to 15 seconds of the call or conversation that you're having with them, it's highly likely that you have identified yourself as a cold caller or not done an amazing job of the first 10 to 15 seconds. And um, the reason why uh, I would say that is I know some people who are amazing at cold calling and it's not luck. And they are very rarely uh, handed an objection within the first 10 to 15 seconds of the, of the call. Um, I think personally, um, you have to be willing to handle those, those objections uh, quite early. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, if they do come at you, be prepared to handle two or three before the conversation actually, uh, actually ends and, and, and be prepared for it. But I would, if you're facing that uh, objection consistently, probably look at what are the things that you're doing in the first 10 to 15 seconds, which you could improve on to uh, avoid that objection. And the COVID one right now, there are some people that are definitely going to be using it with good reason. There are also others. If you're getting a thousand calls a day as, uh, as the customer that John referenced earlier, you're going to get pretty good at getting off the phone quickly. Uh, and um, that uh, is going to come through generic ob objections. And, and COVID is the flavor of the month, maybe the flavor of the quarter, maybe flavor of the year, I'm not sure. Um, but the, the, the point is, go back to what you've done on the call. Um, did you say, is that someone? Uh, and, and that probably identified yourself as a cold caller straight away. If you're making 100 plus cold calls a day, there are probably periods where you drift off. You might not be ready for the call. Um, and uh, it's all about, I think, bringing the right energy um, to the conversation to make sure that you don't identify yourself as a cold caller. A couple of additional tips on that, which I've seen work well. Um, if you are going through periods of outbound prospecting, uh, try and stand up um, rather than be sat down. And, and the body language change can really impact how you speak on the, on the calls. Um, and another thing uh, for me would be to introduce a mirror to your workplace. Um, typically, uh, if you're going through periods of not being successful and you look in the mirror, um, you're not going to like what's looking back at you. And you can uh, use that mirror to guide um, guide your body language, smiling. Those kinds of things can can really have a, have an impact. Greg, I know she jumped off a mute there. Did you have um, something you want to to say on the on the topic of the COVID objection? Uh, yeah, in a way, <laughs> um, but. It, more more in a context of um, what, what you just said, which is obviously, yeah, if you get an objection early, I think the thing with an objection early is that nobody's, like they've not even thought about the objection in reality. They have objected because you're a cold caller. Um, but what we've got to remember is there's nothing wrong with being a cold caller. There's something wrong with being a bad cold caller. <laughs> um, so I can't remember, somebody on the chat, I, I think it was Varun, just said like what are different things that you can try so and i'm sure most most people listening have tried this but telling people that you're a cold caller like one of my favorite lines is look callum this is a cold call you ain't receiving them i ain't making them but give me 30 seconds and we can get we can get through this kind of thing like it, it just stuff like that it it's you're not going to get an objection because they're shocked that you've told them that you are cold calling them in reality because you can call it whatever you like right you can call it a smart call you can call it a planned call you can call it a cold call but Ultimately, if they've never heard from you before and they pick up the phone to you, there's never a good time for that. If there was, they'd have put some time in their diary for it. Um, so it's, it is about how you deal with that first 15 to 30 seconds. And, and I'm finding increasingly the best way to differentiate yourself as a cold caller is to tell people you're a cold caller and be more transparent about it and just be like, look, I've got 90 seconds where I can really try and add value to you in a way we add value to other people. You'll either like it or you'll hate it. And we'll either stop talking or we'll carry on talking like it. Different ways of doing that tends to be the best way to avoid any kind of objection. And the, and the COVID ones just like you say, the flavor of the month in reality. Um, yeah. So there's never a good time to receive a cold call. There's never a good time to, to, to do business unless it's something that you already knew you needed. So just find ways to make sure that they're not throwing that at you straight away. For sure. And I think on your point, it's, it doesn't matter if the outcome is that we don't end up doing business or we don't end up meeting or we don't end up progressing the, the conversation. Always trying to say to people when they first join Engage Tech and, and embark on a sales development career, um, in sales development particularly, you need to get comfortable with like three to 5% success rates being you doing a good job. Um, and it doesn't get much better once you're in, uh, <laughs> in, in fully fledged, you know, like kind of closing roles. But um, you know, it doesn't necessarily, you can't put the phone down and think this doesn't work if you've only made 10 calls this morning. Uh, and, um, and there needs to be a, uh, an element where you're, you're willing to kind of, kind of persevere. Um, what's your process for prioritizing and organizing leads at the moment? John, any input on that? Yeah. Thanks, Daniel, um, for the question. 
it, it's I mean, it's something I've, I've just been doing this morning, to be honest. I think um, for, for us, it's the, 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 natural, the, the natural thing to do is to get drawn to what we would think is, is a really hot lead. And that could be, you know, somebody looking to download our software or is interacting with our website. Um, but really, I think, I, I was going to say this a second ago, it comes down to mentality, it comes down to how you're thinking about, you know, what you're doing every day. So you, you're looking at your lead queue. It's, it's looking at the, the type of the organization. Are they a good fit? And we've mentioned this earlier about sectors. I believe that more than ever, that's, that's important. Um, I didn't used to believe that it was important because I think you can, you should be able to sell to any sector, but it is really important right now. Um, so it's, it's looking at, you know, what, what's the quality of that, that, that lead? Is it somebody that's, that's touching the website that's just looking to download information? It, people are doing a lot more research these days. So, you know, they're downloading white papers, they're interacting with your website. Um, maybe just for, for personal interest. So I think for me, it's, it's, it's part of the armory. And to give you an idea, we've seen a, a 100% uplift of people touching our website in the, in the last six weeks. You know, we've seen a huge, huge increase in the number of people that are actively going and downloading white papers, uh, looking at blogs, that um, that are you know looking at doing uh, research uh, to you know whereas before people were were picking up the phone and wanting to speak to an individual, so it's understanding you know how how to work through that data and you know what when you're touching that individual making sure that you've looked at all the data that you've collected and you've got something that, that applies to, to, uh, to, to that particular bit of investigation that that customer's done. Um, I don't think- John, if I could, sorry. Um, yeah. Just on the point that you raised there about someone maybe being a little bit more motivated to research rather than just speak to someone who might be yeah. uh, looking to sell to them. What do you think the driver is behind that? Uh, or any, um, any... It's for, for, for me, you know, there's, there's always things that are happening with it, within organizations which become a distraction. I, I think there's less distractions, you know, working from home. I think about myself it is that I'm working longer hours, but I'm less distracted. I'm, I'm not getting drawn into uh, water cooler conversations <laughs> or, you know, people stealing my time. You know, I'll be, I'll be honest, you know, when I sit in the office, people do drive-bys and we'll steal an hour, half an hour, whatever it is of my time. So people have actually got more time to, to be more effective. And I think that people are, are spending time researching what, what they're trying to deliver, maybe, maybe not immediately, but uh, they've got more time to plan. Uh, and and we're, we're, see, we're actually starting to see that data coming through. I think it takes a little bit of time to filter through, but we're, we're seeing that across the globe. The, the, that, that, that is uniform across our entire business. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I think the lack of traveling time that people are now having, I think people are still working the hours. So you mentioned about starting at half seven. I think most people are starting at that time. Most people are, you know, having a more flexible working day, uh, but are working, working longer. So, you know, for me, it's, it's you know knowing what communication method to send and when. Um, LinkedIn's a, a great a, a great mechanism to use, um, but I think we have to be very careful. I, I probably get around about sixty recruitment LinkedIn messages a day. It's it, it, you know it's, which is you know it just loses its it, its its message. So it's it's back to making sure that you're using all the different touch points to have a good valid uh, reason to contact the individual um, is yeah. what I would say, is what was working for us anyway. Okay. Uh, and for yourself, Ben, how have you yeah, been prioritizing? I, th I think with prioritizing and organizing, a lot, of, a lot of BDRs I speak to, they focus and are so bogged down with that worry of hitting the monthly target. Something that I try and do with my team is just, just focusing on the day. Like if you've got a target of 20, so you need to be at one meeting a day or one opportunity a day, like how are you going to get that one opportunity? Um, 
So looking at the good conversations you're having and the positive conversations, you can use LinkedIn's sales nav and, and do similar searches. So all that information you already have about that persona and, and that specific person is going to be quite relatable to another person who has a similar job title or in the same industry, wh whatever it is. So use the knowledge that you have at hand um, and really apply that to the conversations that you have with, with other people and just really focus on, on getting, getting through each day rather than worrying about the month during this time. Yep. For sure. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Greg, just, just one final question for, for you before, um, before I just wrap up, like for you, are there any kind of top tips that you'd offer for, um, for building relationships in the, in, in the current climate? Maybe like once you're through the initial uh, thing that you spoke about earlier with the, um, kind of, uh, humorous uh, approach on LinkedIn, once you actually get into a uh, dialogue with someone, how are you becoming a strategic advisor uh, and building a relationship with them? It, I mean, it's, it's all about at the moment who has so the, the 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 most likely way of driving relationship and driving sale is is finding immediate pain right so this new situation the new world the new challenges outside of a very few like small handful of businesses who may have just been completely decimated by the situation which is a, another level of pain which obviously isn't going to be positive right now um the new situation has created immediate pain or at least short to medium term pain and future pain for everybody in certain ways so i think it's about understanding how you add value to that immediate pain now um, and it, it's working that out and that's what i said on the last question how am i prioritizing and organizing my leads i'm working out what immediate pain has now been created for people who may have been my prospects already and and that's what i'm trying to talk to them about and that's what i'm trying to help them with um, and, and it's all, it's, it's that thing of, uh, Glenn, 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 Gary, Glenn, Glenn Ross always be closing is now ABH always be helping, isn't it? And, and I think that is, that is a hundred percent true. Like you should always be looking to help and that's why you will be a better salesperson versus, versus the masses. Um, so yeah, when you're prioritizing, um, and organizing the leads and when you're thinking about how to build relationships now, work out where the new immediate pain is within your, within your prospect base and, and really try and engage those people on that yeah i think that's um that, that's a good point which is just that everyone is uh is going through some kind of uh adjustment or is facing some challenges at the moment um and if you can work out what they are then you're going to be in a better position to uh, to support that that, that organization um, just conscious we've got a minute left just wanted to wrap up on on some of the headline points i think for john um it's uh agents that are outputting uh, more uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and also willing to to stand out and uh while everyone's zigging they're zagging uh, and i think if you look at what um uh, greg said about his uh, uh kind of humorous approach and uh, an ability to just stand out from the crowd uh, the crowd i think you've kind of really backed that up and, and ben referenced the poems as well um, and I think it's just a, a, a lack of fear around just being authentic and, uh, and being yourself and just, uh, just trying, to, trying to do something slightly different uh, is really important and don't conform to, to type. Uh, I think uh, creative ideas around uh, supporting your uh, outreach with things like, um, well, if you've got the, the benefit of being able to offer golf lessons um, at the lower end, maybe, uh, maybe lunch for someone just to take the strain off, um, they, should be, um, they should be considered. Uh, and, and certainly when it comes to, um, to the prospecting, uh, right time of day is, uh, is important and pick the platform. You know, it might be LinkedIn later in the evening, definitely cold calling at certain points in the day, um, early and, and late uh, would be the Engage Tech view on that. Um, thanks very much to everyone who joined on the panel uh, and, and everyone who gave up their time to be here today. Um, we will be posting a recording out on the Engage Tech LinkedIn uh, and um, speak to all of you uh, soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye now.